relationship with nature and the heart of humidifying and evolving elves is the one type that encourages people to act in the good of nature. Well, I suppose one of the things that people say again and again, and I think they're right, is that we cannot continue with business as usual. Um, and they're normally talking about business, they're talking about economics, they're talking about politics. But I think that's equally true when it comes to psychology. Because one of the problems about consumerism and people consuming ever more and acting as if the resources of the planet were infinite is that it's turned into something integral to human identity. People are valued for how many resources they have, what, what sort of car you have, what sort of house uh, you have, how much you consume. And to the extent that we define our relationship towards nature in terms of what we can take from nature, how we can dominate over nature, I think we're never going to be able to solve the problem. So we've got to rethink the, nature, the very nature of our identity and challenge consumerist definitions of human value. We've also got to think about relationships between people because as consumers we're in competition with each other whereas we're only going to solve these problems in cooperation and in collaboration. And finally, um, as I say, you've got to rethink our relationship with nature to go away from one of domination. Um, to think that we can live in a world where we can obliterate the natural, ignore seasons, eat whatever foods we like at uh, any time of year, and we've got to live with nature. We've got to adapt and move with the rhythms and the seasons and so on. So I think there are profound changes in the fundamental nature of human identity which are necessary to deal with the crisis, which are every bit as important as the political uh, and the economic changes. How can we bridge the trust gap between activists and peacemakers? Mm. Well, we do a lot of work on, uh, on groups and on leadership and on issues of trust. And at a very basic level, uh, trust depends upon seeing others as part of our group and acting for the group, being of us and being for us. And leaders who are seen to act for the group um, and leaders who are seen to represent the interests of the group are people we trust and are likely to be influential. But to the extent that we divide leaders from the population, to the extent there seems to be one law for us and a lover for them, then I think there are huge problems in terms of trust uh, and huge problems in terms of the message. I think there are, uh, you know, symbolically, those tensions where people fly in to events like this on private planes or when they go in huge convoys of huge gas-guzzling uh, cars, people begin to think, well, look, can we trust what they say because look at what they do. So I think our leaders need very much to understand they need to be of us and they need to be for us in order for us to trust them. Hmm. I think one of the paradoxes and one of the challenges with any crisis, but particularly the climate crisis, is you've got to give people a sense of urgency, we've got to act and we can't wait to act, but at the same time fear appeals hardly ever work. To inspire fear in people normally leads to people turning their heads away and not listening. So on the one hand there has to be a, a, a very clear statement of just how serious things are, but not in order to make people feel fearful, but in order to, people under, uh, to get people to understand what they can do to change things. In the same way that with one's child, you, know, you alert them to the dangers of crossing the road um, with heavy traffic. You don't try to diminish that or how serious it would be if they did it, but you do it in order to explain to them what they can do. Um, and to give them practices and procedures. So I think that in order to build a positive future, we can't turn our heads away, we can't put our heads in the sand, we are doing that. Uh, we do have, as everybody stresses, an existential crisis. But simply saying that, without saying what we can do, both individually and collectively to change things, I think is unhelpful. And I think at one level, of course, individuals can change their patterns of consumption. 
But we know that the major problem is not what individuals are doing, it's what's being done at a systemic level. So we also need to inspire people to become involved in the collective action which will lead institutions and will lead states to change their ways. One last one. Okay. What role does the language of leadership have to play in inspiring this type of collective thinking? I think leadership is really important and I think leadership can be inspirational and it can also be toxic. I think uh, in many ways one of the problems is that um, leaders often thrive by being parochial, by creating a sense of we and they, an embattled sense of we are accosted by others and therefore the leader is championing us against that threat. Um, and we see that in discourses around migration, um, we see that in, in, in a host of different situations. And I think we need now a, a leadership which is morally strong and we need a leadership which doesn't seek to separate people, and doesn't seek to divide people, but brings people together into an inclusive sense of we. And the final point I would make is that for people to come together, it's not enough just to do it rhetorically. One of the things we discovered, for instance, through the COVID pandemic was that it was a pandemic of inequalities. We might have been in the same storm, we weren't necessarily in the same boat. And so to bring people together, we need not only um, an understanding of what, of, of, of what we have in common, but we need solutions which don't put a greater load on some than others. Because I think there's a real danger that if you use certain mechanisms, for instance, um, individual taxation, then you create a situation in which the poor can no longer do particular things, but whereas the rich can still jet about um, and they can still use uh, polluting forms of action. So every, at every point we've got to think, as I say, both in terms of the way in which we understand the phenomenon, but also in terms of the way that we construct solutions that issues of inequalities are at the very core. Because if you don't do that, then you won't create that unity and you won't create the, the social force which can um, uh, bring about a solution.